Welcome to the Cornfield Search and Rescue Tips and Techniques webinar from the Farm Doc team here on the Urbana Champaign campus of the University of Illinois. On behalf of Jim Baltz, who's behind the scenes today, and myself, Todd Gleason, your host for the program, welcome. Thank you. We're really, really glad that you're here for this particular webinar. Those of you who are here, I know, are interested to hear what Ralph Cockenbrod ha Cookenbrod has to say about the program today. He's with Champaign County Search and Rescue uh, and some other places as well. I know he'll tell us a little bit about that momentarily, but this is something that we all agree is really important in the agricultural world because from time to time, people do get lost in our fields and it makes a difference how you go about the search and rescue. Ralph, thank you for being with us today. I appreciate that. Uh, we'll take questions from the audience as we go through the webinar. They can just be put into uh, the fields, uh, the not the corn fields, but of course the, the, the uh, fields there and the go-to webinar control panel and we'll get those picked up. Ralph, uh, why don't you go ahead and get started? Thank you very much for being here today. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Ralph Cookenbrod. I'm with the Champaign County Search and Rescue Team. I serve as the training coordinator. For those of, the, of, of your audience that may not realize that Champaign County has a search and rescue team, we have been around since, uh, well, been, we're coming up on our 11th anniversary, and we're started back uh, in the day by uh, Dan Walsh, who was, uh, he was worried about somebody wandering off in, uh, the Champaign County Sheriff's Office being unable to uh, locate that person. So he started the ball rolling and the current sheriff has done a great job of supporting us. In addition to what I do for Champaign County, I am the program manager for the Wilderness Search and Rescue Program at the Illinois Fire Service Institute. It's a brand new program and we had our first class uh, back in June, we had 22 participants and uh, it was well received. And our goal is to uh, create more trained searchers. Uh, for those of you who may not know, that searching isn't just walking in the woods and looking around. People who are trained are 65 to 85% effective and untrained searchers are only 25%. So there are specific tips and techniques that we train our searchers that make them um, more effective. So again, thanks for uh, having me. So go ahead and get started here. The, pre the presentation you're seeing is for the most part, what we show our members. So it, for, for farmers, it's gonna be like, of course, you know, they feel to have end rows. Of course, you know, there are, you know, there's different lengths and, and things of that nature. But for the average urbanite who joins our search and rescue team, they don't know a lot of this stuff. So one of the first things we tell them is that cornfields are private property and you must have the owner's permission to search. And that's true in an urban area as well. So we're very cognizant of it. We just can't go on somebody's land because there's a missing person. Rarely do we encounter anybody who is reluctant to have us go on their property, but uh, we do uh, do ask. And uh, we also reiterate that if we do see something, a marijuana grow, we saw one on a search, oh, been a year or so ago up in Rantoul. We were looking for a, a gentleman who had wandered away and inadvertently came across the marijuana grow. We're not looking for that. We don't care about that. Uh, we're looking for our lost person. We also tell them as they're going through the search that we don't damage the crop. You know, try to walk sideways through the end rows so that you don't damage, you know, the, the farmer's hard earned, you know, uh, uh, revenue. He's, he's, you know, doing everything he can to help it grow. And the last thing we want to do is uh, knock it down. And then lastly, we want to ask the farmer, the grower, if anything has been sprayed on the crops. Is there anything that it's been applied that could hurt us? So we just wanna ask that up front. And if it's and if it has been, then we would look at the MSDS sheets and make sure that, you know, we're dressed appropriately. Do we need to take any precautions, things of that nature? And it's basically just to make sure that uh, we keep our searchers safe. Our typical scenarios is a kid wanders into a field. He's playing, uh, thinks it'd be fun to play hide and seek in the cornfield. Maybe the family dog ran into the field and they followed the dog into the field and got turned around and can't figure out how to get back. Same is true with a special needs person, somebody who uh, is cognitive impaired and for fun, for whatever reason goes into a field 
and again gets turned around doesn't know how to get a, get back or uh, it just kind of get loses their bearings and um, and can't find their way uh, to safety we run into this occasionally a uh, drunk driver has an accident wants to avoid DUI the sheriff's office will have us search cornfield look for the gentleman make sure he hasn't uh, succumbed to any injuries or passed out so we we're asked to go search uh, cornfields for people who have been in car accidents. Field worker, detasseler, uh, roger, somebody goes out into the field, gets away from the group, misses, you know, is, is missed at lunchtime. Uh, do we need to go look for him? And so we're, we're ready to, to, to go for any sort of worker. Someone can have a medical issue. Kid detasseling corn, doesn't feel well, says, hey, I'm going to go over here and throw up and doesn't come back and the team doesn't know where to look for him we would certainly uh, go look for someone uh, that way somebody could just be lost for whatever reason they end up in a field and there's a good chance they think it's likely that our subject is in a field and we'll go go look for him and anybody who decides to leave Teenager gets in an argument with the, with her parents and says, I'm just going to run away, goes into a cornfield, and again, gets turned around or is reluctant to come back out of the field. We would certainly be called to uh, uh, aid in, uh, in that sort of thing. A typical uh, case study here is, uh, again, a two-year-old girl follows her dog into a cornfield around seven. This is sort of the typical timeline of how things go. In the, this was obvious in Canada, but here in the United States, you call 911 and MetCAD calls the police. And typically, the, the police are called initially just to kind of rule out whether it's uh, criminal in nature. Otherwise, uh, often it's passed on to rural fire departments. But in this case, in Canada, they have an emergency response team and they showed up and they organized uh, assets. 150 searchers showed up, two canine teams showed up, and they were even able to get a helicopter. Searchers were, had GPS, which uh, enables the uh, command post to track their movement through the field. Um, and you'll see some examples of this next bullet point. Helicopter could not get any infrared images. And, you, and just kind of give you a preview of what's coming up. Infrared only works if there's a temperature differential. So on a cold day, a warm body is going to show up really easily. But when it's 90 degrees out or hotter and a human body was which is just slightly above 90 degrees there's not going to be much differential so it's not going to be terribly effective in a search fortunately for the for the little girl the temperature only dropped to about 52 degrees not terribly bad in the winter or the fall when temperatures drop down into freezing we certainly worry more about our subject's survival but uh two-year-old 52 degrees really shouldn't you know, be too terrible for her. But she was found uh, the next day, 10 o'clock, by two neighbors. And again, they were, you know, when you get little kids out, the whole world wants to uh, to answer the, the call and to assist. So it's not terribly hard to get volunteers to come out for a, for a little kid. Everybody feels that, you know, it's it's what we need to do as a society to, to find, find the little kid. Here's some other examples, uh, Quad Cities. Uh, Four-year-old in Ottawa, Michigan, uh, Windsor, uh, Canada, two years, it only took uh, 90 minutes. Um, this person was found with a uh, drone with infrared. So again, it was October. It was probably a pretty good differential between the temperatures. So this, this uh, youngster was found safe and sound. 20, year, 20 hours with a, with a uh, three-year-old in October, you know, they're cutting it pretty close. It, I, I would uh, be understandably worried and I would be looking for additional assets uh, if a search had gone. What we call the first operational period. After about eight hours, you want to rattle, you know, you, you want to rattle the cages and get as many people out to assist you as you possibly can. And here's an Aurora 12 hours. So for, for the farmers, this is going to be, the, the, these images aren't going to be anything new. But, you know, if you're looking for somebody who wandered into this, into this field before planning, you can see somebody from a long distance. You might even be able to drive along the road or a lane with a pair of binoculars and assure yourself that the person, your subject, isn't in this field. 
it's getting a little trickier when the corn gets up about two feet high. You might be able to drive down the rows and look. And certainly if you could fly a drone overhead, the person is much easier to see in uh, in, in the foliage that uh, is no no higher than uh, two, two feet or so. Now it's starting to get tricky. The uh, rows are starting to leaf over and it's going to get harder for uh, you to see down into those rows, especially you know with a with a drone or a hel or I should say an airplane. Airplanes have to move obviously much faster than a helicopter who can hover. And the drone technology today is just phenomenal. They've got amazing technology on the drones, and we certainly uh, think those are just a tremendous asset to the team. And this is what we uh, what we would be concerned about uh, today. Uh, corn is well over you know six eight feet tall. Uh, full leafed out, leave, the leaves are uh, interlocking between the rows, and it would be really tough to go in and see. And then after harvest, you know, with today's uh, harvesting techniques, pretty much chews up any vegetation that is, that is remaining, and it is relatively easy to see somebody. So it'd be almost like back to what it was like when there was uh, pre-planting. We tell our uh, searchers that field, fields are not uniform in uh, in shape, length. Uh, we tell them, you know, and, and for the new people, we walk through the, basically we want them to see this this presentation where we go over the difference between end rows and the, the, the long rows and how to search the, the little uh, peninsulas or the, the little panhandles that, that stick out because we, we want to make sure that we search every area. And that's one of the reasons we carry a GPS that has the tracking feature. And then I'm going to mention a, uh, an app that we have in, uh, installed on phones coming up a little bit called Sartopo. And it enables us to, people in the command post, to see where our search team went. So if we did miss uh, a, a peninsula or a panhandle out in the, in the field, they could redirect uh, assets to go back and make sure that we search that area. But for the... The average urbanite, he may not realize that in Illinois and throughout the Midwest, the uh, the roads are arranged in one mile by one mile sections, and the fields are, of course, you know, arranged, you know, segmented in those uh, in in that one mile by one mile grid. And what we typically tell people, especially for that we're worried about finding an injured subject, how far do we have to carry them? Well, in a normal field, anything you know, typical we're only gonna to have to carry that person a maximum of half a mile before we come to a road that an ambulance can access. So, it's, so it gives a little bit of peace of mind knowing that you're only gonna to have to carry somebody half a mile, but still carrying anybody any length of time at all is just horribly difficult. Um, people, the mannequins we use at, uh, at IFSI are weigh 165 pounds and it's everything six people can do to carry this mannequin and there's a whole lot of people out there that weigh more than 165 pounds. So it becomes pretty, it's, it's tough carrying, carrying people. So we, we encourage people to stay in good shape. And we also encourage people not to get lost in fields just because it's so hard to get them out. So here's what their typical picture we show of what a field looks like when, uh, when we're training our searchers. Good example here of the end rows, the long rows. But we want to you know, explain that there are different crops out there. Obviously, the corn at this time of year is six to eight feet tall. Soybeans can be four to five feet tall. And, and especially if they're drilled beans, very difficult to walk through. Somebody were, if somebody were to get into a, a soybean field and lay down, and uh, if it could somehow dis, uh, uh, undisturb the, the, uh, the beans as they walked into it, it would be impossible to find them. But uh, typically, people don't walk into drilled soybeans, so, but people do go into uh, the planted cornfields. So we should explain the, the, uh, the differences of the, between corn and beans. And go back here just a second. They can be in different owners. So if we have permission to, to search through Farmer Jones's field and Farmer Smith is adjacent to it, we need to make sure that we find out who owns the adjacent field before we just blunder in to, and end up trespassing on somebody's field that we don't have permission uh, to go into. 
And we explain the differences between the uh, end rows and uh, long rows. And again, if we're starting out on the outside of the field and walking in to make sure that we're careful when we walk through the, the uh, end rows to um, uh, make sure we don't damage the crop. The rows are typically 30 inches apart and uh, you know it's maybe shoulder width and the, the, the individual plants are only six inches apart. So if you wanna cross through the rows, it's going to be tough to do it without without injuring the plant as as you make your way across. So we pretty much tell people to stay in your row, and you're going to walk all the way to the end. We typically also uh, search the end rows first, and then uh, and then spread out. And I've got a, a graphic coming up here in a little bit that kind of shows how we how we'll go through the field. We warn people of the hazards, and at this time of year, it is just ungodly hot out there. Uh, you're going to be in sunlight, and you there's not a lot of uh, if, there's a, if there is a breeze, it's not going to get to you uh, when you're down in the corn. So we're going to run the risk of people getting dehydrated in any sort of heat-related illnesses, heat stroke, uh, anything that would de de be debilitating to them from uh, heat. So we make sure everybody goes in with plenty of water and that we take many breaks so they have adequate opportunities to uh, take in water. So this time of year, it's often hot, hot and humid. And as I mentioned, there is little air movement in the field. The other thing we tell people is the edges of the leaves are really sharp. So we want people wearing long pants and long sleeves. Uh, we've got some uh, example of a hat coming up. If they have to wear gloves, we encourage them to wear gloves, certainly safety glasses. If they're asthmatic or have respiratory issues, they may want to carry or wear a mask uh, because of the pollen. It can be muddy out there, so there's a, a risk of slip trips and falls. Insects and wildlife. Uh, it's kind of scary to kick up a deer that may have a fawn out there. Uh, it could be stinging an insects. And what we worry about with uh, insects is a person allergic to bees. So could you come across a you know, wasp, yellow jacket, something along that line and get stung? And unless the person has an EpiPen, it can turn really bad for the team uh, right away. So, and we also ask uh, our searchers if they have any medical issues. And hopefully if they know that they're allergic to uh, an insect bite that they carry their own uh, epinephrine pen. Weeds. Typically, we don't see poison ivy out there, but there could be, you know, thistles. Somebody walks up against it, you know, brushes up against it, gets uh, the the thorns in their uh, in their pant legs, or reaches down and gets the uh, little stickers in their hands. And what that does is now it becomes a distraction. We want everybody out there focusing on the search, and now somebody's got these little pokers or stickers in their in their leg or their hand, and now they're not thinking about the search anymore. So that's one of the reasons that we want to point out. Uh, the things that can uh, keep somebody from focusing on the search. As I mentioned earlier, is there anything that's been sprayed on the field that we need to be concerned about? You know, since insecticides can be uh, pretty nasty, they're very close to uh, nerve uh, agents. So we want to make sure that we don't put our searchers in harm's way. And if we do find the subject, what do we need to treat uh, him or her for? What sort of chemicals have they been exposed to? Because they've probably been exposed to it longer than we have. People get claustrophobic down in there and certainly disoriented. You get turned around, you'll forget which way you walked in unless you can look down and see your footprints. We worry about subjects with respiratory issues because of the pollen, the, 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 the very humid air. Uh, it's going to be difficult to breathe for them. And if we, somebody admits, and we always, you know, there's no shame or uh, you know, no reason to, not to speak up. So we want to know if you've got anything ahead of time so that you don't become an issue out in the field. Because the last thing we want to do is have a searcher with a medical issue, because now we have to stop the search and, uh, when, and deal with our searcher's issues. So we want everybody to be upfront with us and uh, take whatever uh, mitigation uh, uh, methods to, uh, so they can continue their search or uh, drop out and, uh, and we can continue going on. We want to wear a protective eyewear. We don't want, you know, obviously pollen getting in their eyes. We don't want the uh, a corn leaf to uh, injure somebody's eye. Again, it's painful for the person, maybe ultimately debilitating for the person, but again, it is a distraction, and now we have to stop the search and deal with it. Here's one of the really cool uh, 
pieces of gear that we have. A few years ago, we had a team member who worked for DeKalb and he provided everybody on the team with a detasseling hat. And it's, um, our hats are uh, boonies and they have this mesh in front of them. They, that pretty, for the most part, keeps all of the leaves away from your face, which is uh, which, which is quite nice. The fluorescent orange is uh, super helpful. And I might mention now, all of our team members wear fluorescent neon uh, day glow colors. Uh, our team color is orange. We encourage people to uh, go to Farm and Fleet, Dick's, places of that nature after hunting season, so we purpose, purposely picked uh, blaze orange as our colors because you can buy these colors or th this color clothing uh, at a discount at the end of, uh, of hunting season. But if somebody shows up in the fluorescent uh, construction green, that's fine too. But we do want everybody wearing fluorescent clothing just because we, it makes it that much easier for us to keep track of people when uh, we're on a search and in the, uh, either a wooded environment or in a cornfield. As I mentioned, high, uh, long pants, long sleeve shirt, and it's gotta be high visibility. Somebody who shows up, I have, I have a, a picture of a little girl who was found by a searcher who was wearing camouflage. And I point out, if you have any control over what your team wears, please do not dress them in camouflage clothing. I understand that often you can get this stuff military surplus and it's cheaper, but it's just impossible to see somebody wearing camouflage in a field. Gloves, if you think it's necessary, Good, uh, sturdy boots, uh, preferably waterproof in case uh, we are out there in the mud. If you're uh, susceptible to pollen, we ask that you wear a, uh, some sort of dust mask to uh, limit your exposure to breathing in the pollen. A whistle, a lot of our commands are often made by whistle, but especially if we have a long line where the uh, team leader can't see uh, either end of our search line and becomes hard to hear uh, a voice commands, especially in high winds. Whistles work really well. Uh, it doesn't take near the air to blow a whistle that it does to yell. And then all of our searchers carry a basic search and rescue pack with all of their their own personal uh, personal preferences. And again, we want everybody carrying water. We want on a typical search, we want at least two liters of water on each person. And it's fun, kind of funny because we also reiterate to our searchers. Do not share your gear. Your gear is for you or maybe the subject. Uh, we want all of our searchers to be self-sufficient. So if somebody doesn't bring water, uh, we need to have speaks with that person. We don't expect our other searchers to uh, dig into their packs and share, unless the guy has drank all of his water and he is in certain, you know, certainly needs it. But uh, for the most part, we want our, our searchers individually uh, self-sufficient. Some of our challenges is how big is the area to be searched? A quarter mile wide field contains 528 rows and the length could be up to a half mile. And some of them can be even longer than that. There are some examples where it could be a three quarter or maybe even the full section, which would be a full mile long. But it's gonna take 44 trips out and back for a team of six, six searchers. And that's typically what our search is. We like a team of five people with a team leader. And uh, they call that the span of control. One person can control up to about seven people. It's slow going because we don't wanna miss the person. We don't wanna walk over it. So we wanna make sure that uh, our pace is not too fast that uh, we end up going over missing the person. But by the same token, it can't be so slow that we're not efficient. So, you know, like I said, it can take 30 to 40 minutes to make one pass. And if a field's wide, we're gonna be out there for a very long time, which translates to our subjects gonna be out there for a very long time as well. We're gonna encourage uh, people to be rehabbed, uh, which means you're gonna sit this next pass out, you're gonna sit in the shade, you're gonna drink plenty of water, maybe get something, a snack to eat, and, uh, and just make sure that you're fresh for the next time. Because as you get tired, again, you become distracted and the distraction uh, takes away from your ability to focus on the task at hand, which is being out in the field uh, looking for our subject. Another thing we tell our searchers is, um, I come from an aviation background, and we have a thing called sterile cockpit, where the pilots never talk about anything other than flying the plane below 10,000 feet. We want our searchers talking about nothing but the search on a search 
because, you know, you get to talking about, you know, hey, how about them cubs? How about them bears? And now you're not thinking about our subject anymore. So we want to limit the conversations to the task at hand as well. Um, we need a lot of people. Uh, we can teach what we call spontaneous volunteers. So if they, the media says, hey, we're going to be looking for little Johnny, you know, in this area and people do show up. There are things we can have people do. Again, as I mentioned, trained searchers are a lot more effective than the untrained searcher, but there are some tasks that we can easily train somebody to do in a short, short period of time to enable them to uh, help and contribute to the cause. One of the best things you can do is if we're convinced, if we're absolutely certain a person is in the field, is to establish containment. And here in Illinois, that's easy to do because our roads are only a mile apart. And this is one of those jobs that we can do for or give to somebody who isn't necessarily well trained in search and rescue techniques. So we can have law enforcement drive around the section to make sure our person doesn't get out of the cornfield they're in and into the adjacent cornfield across the road. That would be really horrible. We think little Johnny is in the north section and he has somehow managed to cross the road and he's now in the southern uh, full mile section, which would be horrible because now we're looking in the wrong spot. But we can have a uh, law enforcement patrol the road. We can also have fire department people park an engine at a corner at an intersection. If they've got a ladder, they can extend the ladder and now it's Firefighter can look off into the distance and see, perhaps see our subject or see the uh, corn moving. We can, if it's a night, if it's at night, they can run the uh, the lights, make it, you know, bright flashing lights might be easy to see for our subject to find their way back if they're able to self-rescue, run sirens, sort of a, uh, a sound beacon. And again, this is a really good job for spontaneous volunteers. If somebody wants to help, but they're not in physical, the kind of physical condition where they can go into a field, if they own a car and a cell phone, we can put them on a county road and park them in one spot. Hey, just look down this road. If you see little Johnny cross the road, give us a call. Um, or you can drive around the road. What, uh, you know, depending on how number of volunteers we have, you know, we might be able to just have them park, or we may ask them to, to drive around the section and just um, do everything we can to keep little Johnny in that cornfield. Our teams are made up of a team leader. Typically, we don't have a radio operator. We're not that, we don't have that deep of a bench, but it's nice to have somebody, especially if that person isn't capable of searching, but they want to tag along, they could operate the radio, carry the GPS for us. We're going to have flankers, typically two people, and this is uh, the, uh, the uh, people on each end of the, uh, of the search line. And then we'll have th three to five searchers uh, in between the two flankers and ahead of the team leader. And I've got a graphic coming up here right now. And so when we show up to a field and we're looking at the, uh, the rows here, we're going to have flankers. And searchers and then a flanker and then the team leader, and perhaps the uh, radio GPS person. And depending on how thick it is, um, and this graphic isn't terribly, uh, I won't say it's not accurate, but if, if you're the team, if you're the searcher in the middle, you can see one row to your left and one row to your right. So that means the searcher on your left can see one row in to, to his right and his left. So we're typically two rows apart. And that's about when the, that, that's about the extent we can see. So we aren't, we're rarely three rows apart. It's, it, 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 it's really hard to see horizontally in corn. So we're, we're going to walk down a row and we're going to have a row we're responsible for on the right and left. And then the guy next to us is going to be responsible for that as well. Again, visibility is limit, very limited in a full, fully grown field. The, these next two terms, the average uh, maximum detection range, we refer to the AMDR the, or the range of detection, are search and rescue techniques. And it's how we calibrate our eyes in a wilderness environment. Uh, if we're looking for a small child, we'll take something maybe the size of a big backpack, throw it in the, in the foliage, and uh, we, we back up and count our steps to the, uh, until we can identify the object and that calibrates our eyes. And that's how we uh, determine our distance 
our spacing and our distances in a wilderness setting. We don't have to do that in the corn because the rows make it very easy to uh, to determine how far apart we are. Like I said, typically we're not going to be more than two rows up away from our neighbor. In a typical search, if the foliage isn't too bad, we can, like I said, uh, space every other row. But if it's terribly thick, we may be walking down every row, which it would just require an army out there to uh, to help us search for our subject. Team leaders should determine the pace, and it can't be too fast. But again, it can't be too slow. We want to be efficient, but we want to make sure that everybody's going fast enough, or not so fast that they they miss uh, seeing our subject in the adjacent row. We often use a whistle to uh, advance or to stop. Again, if it's difficult to hear, uh, like if, if it's a windy day and it's and we have a, a long search line, um, we're we're going to want to use a whistle for commands. We always search the end rows first, and then uh, we start off at the edge of the field and start working our way in, unless we know that little Johnny went into the middle of the field. And again, it comes down to being able to do a good uh, interview with a with a reporting person. You know that they see Grandma walk out the front door, down the sidewalk, and into the field, or uh, are they just not sure where she might have gone in? And if the little little boy followed the dog in, they have any idea where? you know, they first went into the field. And obviously we'll search there first. Flag, that's our, uh, we have uh, flagging tape, bright fluorescent tape that we uh, denote where we start and where we, where we stop. And it's real handy if, uh, if we get pulled off for a search, uh, say it, it's getting dark and they don't want us to search at night, we'll tie off where we, uh, where we went in and where we came back out so that we know in the next morning where we can begin again. This is going to seem kind of funny, but uh, all of our uh, searchers, and especially our flankers, carry magnetic compasses, plain base plate, very generic type compasses. And when they start walking down the field, we want them to note which direction they're going. If you get turned right, if you get disoriented out there, it's nice to know which way you've gone, especially if you don't have the uh, wherewithal to note, you know, look down and see where your footprints came from. But we do want everybody kind of knowing that they're, you know, on a heading of 270, which is west or north or east, um, in case they do happen to get turned around. It also helps them keep their bearings and be able to uh, call in over the radio in order for uh, them to tell the incident command where we have found our subject. So we're going to stop at the end rows where, where the search manager tells us to. Hopefully we found the, the subject and we can stop there. Um, but uh, when we uh, get to the end, we're going to move, Flanker's going to move over, uh, followed by the searchers. And it's very methodical. We, we, we have a, and that's why we train. You know, we, everybody, we have a very specific method how we do it. And we make sure that uh, everybody knows how to do it. As I mentioned, we train on a regular basis. And uh, next month, August is a uh, uh, cornfield search technique. So we're going to review with all of our searchers and the new people that we've got on board how we search cornfields and how we uh, when we get to the end of the row how we transition from the the one pass we've just made to the next pass going back obviously we want to keep a straight line and this is super important never lose sight of the searcher on uh, either side one of the ex Examples I give to people is uh, pretend I used to hunt pheasants when I was in my younger days. And, and when you're hunting pheasants, everybody has a shotgun. So you want to stay in a row, in a straight line across in case a bird gets up. You don't want somebody ahead of you if you're carrying a gun so you don't shoot him. And by the same token, you, want, you don't want to be the, the guy in the back when a bird jumps up. So I said, just pretend you're pheasant hunting and everybody's got a gun and you want to stay in that straight line because it's more efficient and it's much easier for the uh, team leader to keep track of his searchers if they're all in a straight line and everybody can see to the person on their right or left. We'll often yell as we go through the field, yell out the uh, subject's name. Um, we also will blow whistles. If we blow whistles, we uh, do it on a count of three and everybody closes their puts their hands over their ears and then we go one two three and then we blow the whistle 
we, we uh, cover our ears to make sure that we don't damage our hearing so that we're able to hear our subject if they could could hear us. But we'll call out their name if it's uh, a little kid, you know, if the uh, parents have taught him a uh, stranger danger word, we'll want to know that word so that we can yell out so the, the little kid isn't uh, afraid of the uh, of, of the noises or the, the strangers working their way through that field. This is the app I was talking about. It's called Sartopo. It's free and uh, we download it onto our uh, searcher's phones and it enables us to keep track of uh, each individual searcher as well as the areas that we've gone through. We tell that uh, we, we tell the search team that you know, for the most part, we only want the flankers and the team leader turning it on because otherwise the map gets uh, pretty, uh, pretty cluttered. Here's a uh, example of the Sartopo. This is a, a field search that we did last August. And the, uh, the, the red is the, uh, the tracks of the, uh, the flankers as uh, we worked our way through that field. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, drones are a magnificent uh, piece of uh, equipment now that we can utilize. They, they, they've got a, the ability to hover. They can carry different uh, cameras. They can do infrared. They can do visual. What's really cool is the, the pilot's got this little bitty screen, but he can project it on a much larger screen and have observers looking at this giant screen TV. He's concentrating on flying, but he's got people looking at this screen to, to point out anything that you know bears investigation. So the they're, they're they're pretty cool to have. So they can they can help us assess the the big picture. They can fly over and see what we're up against. And if there's any knockdown corners, so maybe the person you know laid down and and was able to to disturb the the vegetation enough that it it's it's you know if you're curious if you if you see something that that doesn't look like the rest of the field, it bears investigation. So uh, a drone can certainly fly over and check that out for us. And they can do the containment. So instead of having somebody drive around the section, we know they're in a particular part of the field, they can just fly uh, orbits around that area of the field and uh, make sure our uh, subject doesn't get any farther away. Thermal. So this is, uh, this is Mr. Baltz from yesterday. He went out, he had a great drone pilot in uh, one of the terrific resources we have at Champaign County. But he took his drone out and using infrared. Again, it was temperature was 88 degrees yesterday, and with the the ditch behind him, it is very hard to discern where he is. So you know, and so so midday this wouldn't work terribly well. It might work better early morning when it's you know it might might be 65 degrees, maybe 70 degrees. But again, we're looking for that gradient. We we need a you know, 10, 20 degree di uh, gradient for the for the person to pop up on the screen. Otherwise, it's pretty much going to blend in. And if you weren't able to see him in that, that gray, uh, black and white picture, you know, that's where he is. This is the same picture, one taken visually and one taken infrared. And again, in a cornfield, it's not going to make any difference at all. You're, and and if you're looking visually. You know, he's wearing orange and he's still hard to see. Um, and then we've got a video coming up that, that it demonstrates just how hard it is to locate somebody uh, in, a, in a cornfield. So if you're looking, it's easier to see the movement than it is, you know, the, the high visibility clothing that they're wearing. You know, everybody's wearing, you know, blaze orange and unless they get to an open spot in the vegetation, you can't see them. The most easiest part of them to see is the actual movement when they're, they're moving the, the, uh, the corn plants out of the way to make their way to the edge. So it is really tough to, to see people in the cornfield. Other air assets, helicopters and aircraft have the same visibility problems. Aircraft, airplanes, they move fast. They're just you know, if, if you got somebody who's got an airplane that's willing to fly low and slow, sure, but they're not going to be as slow as a helicopter. And helicopters are ungodly expensive uh, to operate. 
So, and in this area, you may, especially this time of year, you may be, it may be tough getting somebody to, to uh, donate a helicopter. And as we mentioned, infrared detection and imaging is likely to be ineffective uh, with the tall, dense vegetation that we have. Uh, in the fall, it might be easier just because the plants are going to be drier and uh, hopefully the temperatures are going to be um, much less ambient air temperature and, and somebody who, who, who is walking around or healthy is going to be uh, well over 90 degrees and will show up in infrared. So uh, to wrap things up, one of the most important things we can do right off the bat is to contain the area. Uh, get those assets, people show up, how can I help? Hey, would you do me a favor, just drive around the section or sit at this intersection and look west and just let us know if it looks like our subject has you know, tried to cross the road. Even under perfect conditions, it's gonna be a long, slow process. You're gonna need boots on the ground. Uh, those case studies we had earlier, they were all found with people, boots on the ground. The dementia patient that walked away down in Douglas County was found by people walking through the cornfield. There's just no substitute for, uh, for live trained assets. Uh, we're gonna need a lot of people. That, uh, the, the more people we have, the faster we can search an area. And if this person is in distress, um, my mother, it was one of the, the uh, jokes that my wife and I had, uh, lived in an assisted living place. It wasn't uh, an Alzheimer's unit. They had the ability to come and go. And it was always our big concern if she was going to walk out of the door of the uh, the front door of the uh, of the facility and get into a cornfield, and we're going to be looking for her. At 87 years old, um, she's not going to fare well in this weather, and she certainly wouldn't do well in uh, in cold weather as as well. So we want to find these people soon because they can be they can get into distress very quickly uh, given the atmospheric conditions we have. Our searchers have to be prepared for the conditions that they're going to encounter. Uh, there is no easy cornfield. They're all gonna be hot, humid. They're gonna have pollen uh, falling down on them. The leaves are gonna be sharp and they're gonna be bugs. And if it's early in the morning, it's gonna be dew and you're gonna get soaking wet and cold initially. And then you're gonna get really, really hot as the sun climbs in the sky. Your air assets are gonna be of limited use just because of the, uh, the height of the corn and the uh, thickness of the foliage. But remember that uh, you know, the well-being of the person that you're looking for could ultimately come down to your ability to search efficiently and effectively, and you can only do that by being trained and uh, having the proper mindset, because it's gonna be a slog out there, and uh, you need to stay focused, and understand that this person and their, their loved ones are counting on you. So that pretty much wraps up my uh, uh, my uh, presentation. Uh, any questions? And we will take those questions, Ralph, in just a second. There are a couple of things we need to go through as well. Ralph Cookenbrook, uh, Cookenbrook, yeah, of course, is with the Illinois Fire Service Institute. We would like to thank them along with the Champaign County Sheriff's Office Search and Rescue, who Ralph works with, and the University of Illinois, the Farm Talk team, uh, Jim Baltz, who is behind the scenes, along with our sponsors here uh, for the Farm Doc webinar series. You can find all of these archived on the Farm Doc website. Our sponsors include the TIAA Center for Farmland Research, Compare Financial, Corteva AgriSciences, uh, Farm Credit Illinois, Illinois Corn Growers, the Growmark uh, System, FS, that is, and the Illinois Soybean Association. Our educational partners are FBFM, the College of Aces, here on campus, U of I Extension, and of course, uh, University of Illinois. Uh, if you do have questions, pop those into the system and we'll take those. Uh, there was a comment and I, I, I'm interested, Ralph, to see what you think about this. Somebody suggested that the flankers uh, might carry one of those large uh, flags. Uh, I think he suggested that we're on the back of mopeds, but you'll see them uh, on any slower moving vehicles, maybe uh, uh, the recumbent bicycles and such that they are flying and put those on the flankers. Uh, just anything, I suppose, Ralph, that is uh, usable uh, and makes somebody easy to see would be worthwhile. Those um, might be an okay idea, but if well, you've got questions or... 
it is an excellent idea. And we've actually used a, a technique very similar to that. A lot of our searchers use uh, walking sticks. And what they will do is they'll put their bright orange hat on a walking stick and stick it up in the air. And uh, our uh, incident command post has a remote camera. So we it's on a mast. So uh, they call it E1. It's a big giant RV with a, uh, with a telescoping um, mast on it that has a camera. They extend this thing and the camera can look off in the distance. And we've, we have purposely put a orange hat on a walking stick and raised it above our head and waved it around and they are able to see it. So that is a, that is a great idea. The, the uh, moped flag is, is spot on. That, that would be a great technique. Anything that makes people more visible in the field, whether the, the, those who are searching or, uh, or otherwise would be useful. There is a question here. Somebody wants to know if they wanted to become a volunteer, uh, how do they go about being trained? Well, bless their heart. We are always looking for new members of the search and rescue team. Uh, I would encourage you to contact John Dwyer at the Champaign County EMA office. If you and your visitors are always welcome, we meet the third Tuesday of every month at IFSI, which is at 11 Gertie Drive. We're just down the street from the uh, uh, U of I Credit Union. And we encourage people to come out and if, if nothing else, just see what, it, what we're about. But to become trained, just join our team. We do a background check, as I mentioned earlier, but we train our people in-house. Uh, we have what we call, uh, call SARGO, Search and Rescue Ground Operations Training, twice a year, once in the spring, once in the fall, which teaches uh, people the very basics. But even if you don't catch one of those, you show up at the August meeting, you're gonna get you know, trained on how to search in uh, cornfields. Oh, IFSI is Illinois Fire Service Institute, I'm sorry. It's uh, yeah. my employer. Uh, so <laughs> we're, uh, and, and as I mentioned, we have a brand new search and rescue program that for the most part, uh, it's easiest to access if you are a firefighter, a volunteer or career, you can certainly uh, access, uh, take our classes through that. But this last class that we had in June was open to the public. So anybody could have taken our uh, class at, uh, at IFSI. But in order to become trained, just become a member of a team. And Champaign County's got a team. Um, McLean County's got a team. Um, uh, Coles County, I think, started one a, a while back. But uh, just just come to uh, IFSI, 11 Gertie Drive, uh, third Tuesday of every month, and uh, we'll be happy to uh, welcome you and join you. Have you join our ranks? And just to clarify, the Illinois Farm Service, uh, Illinois Fire Service Institute, or IFSI, is a statewide agency or institution. Yes, um, we are a member. So, we, yeah, we are all part of the University of Illinois. We're, we we kind of fall into the same auspices as the uh, Police Institute. So we're all one big happy family here. Um, I see we have a question about men versus women. We have a lot of women on our team. Uh, we've got one lady who is really, really good at navigation. She yeah, actually took up the sport of orienteering, which is a, a it's popular in Europe, but it's a, it's, it's a way of, uh, it's a game, almost like a foot race where they have compasses and maps and they move through the, through the woods, you know, very rapidly. But, uh, so this lady is really good at it. Um, my wife helped write the uh, search and rescue curriculum for IFSI. Uh, we've got, we have a number of women on our, uh, on our team and they're just every bit as physically capable and mentally, you know, good at searching as, uh, as any man. So yeah, we welcome men and women on our team by all means. Any final word from you as we close out our time together this morning? Again, thank you very much for having me. Um, if you suspect that you know, little Johnny wandered off or grandma wandered away, please call 911 right away. The best thing you can do for them is to get resources in the field as soon as possible to go uh, to start looking uh, for them because time, time is our enemy. Uh, it, it's only gonna get worse as time goes on. So please call 911 fast. Oh, uh, our meetings start at 6.30. 6.30 uh, at IFSI and, and please come and join us. We, 
we really like uh, new blood. Well, thank you, Thanks. Ralph. Ralph Cookenbrod is with the Champaign County Search and Rescue, the Illinois Fire Service Institute. You've been listening and watching a webinar entitled Cornfield Search and Rescue Tips and Techniques. If you want to share this webinar with others uh, in your uh, uh, orbit. You can do that, and you'll be able to do that later today, I'm sure. Uh, Jim Baltz, who's behind the scenes, will have this up on our website at farmdocdaily.illinois.edu. It'll be in the archive. Uh, you also, and I'll bet Jim will put this here. In fact, I don't have to bet. I know Jim will put it there. Yeah, you can just search YouTube and, sa and send the link along, but if you want to follow us uh, or just search the whole of our YouTube uh, universe from the FarmDoc site. It's youtube.com backslash at FarmDoc, and you'll be able to see the webinar is, uh, there as well. On behalf of Ralph Kokenbrod, uh, along with Jim Baltz, I've been your host for the day, University of Illinois Extension Farm Broadcaster, Todd Gleason.